welcome to today's Real Talk on Environmental Justice. Um, Real Talk Voices from the Margins is produced by the Woody Guthrie Center, the Tulsa Artist Fellowship, Folk Alliance International, the Black Wall Street Times, and the Tri-City Collective. My name is Autumn Brown, and I will serve as today's host and moderator. I'm a doctoral candidate at Oklahoma State University with a focus on social foundations and education. And I am a member of the Tri-City Collective, an organization founded in 2016. Um, our work is driven by a passion for social justice and creative expression, as we aim to provide learning opportunities and artistic opportunities outside of the classroom for youth and adults. Tulsa remains a segregated city, but we often ignore the connection between segregation and the environment. Um, so today, our virtual Real Talk will feature four experts whose knowledge can help address these issues. So please join me in welcoming Maggie Chamberlain. Maggie is a third year PhD student and graduate teaching assistant in the sociology department at Oklahoma State University. Maggie's research interests include environmental justice, hazards and disasters, social movements, social media, and geospatial methods. She is Oklahoma State's first recipient of the William Averett Anderson Fund Fellowship. Her dissertation will focus on understanding the impact of natural and techno technological disasters on different populations. Chamber Chamberlain currently serves as the sociology graduate student SGA president. Also join us. Also joining, joining us is Carly Griffith Hotbet. Carly is a citizen of Cherokee Nation and a seasoned legal professional admitted to practice in Oklahoma, Cherokee Nation, and Muscogee Creek Nation. With an affinity for government law, agriculture, tribal policy, administration, and in her current role as director of tribal enterprise with the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative, she works with tribes and in tribal policy to advance food security and tribal agriculture and inter enterprise development. Prior to joining IFAI, she created and directed the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources at Muscogee Creek Nation, where she is initiated and, uh, and where she initiated, excuse me, an overhaul of the agribusiness operation, resulting in a 70% loss margin reduction and set the program on track for profitability. Carly clerked for the late Oklahoma Supreme Court Justice Marion Opala while in law school, in addition to municipal internships with the city of Lawton and the city of Norman. She maintains a perfect success record for summary judgment motions in Oklahoma district and federal court. She has a 100% success rate in the courts of Cherokee Nation. Next, we have Nancy Moran. Nancy um, has served as a public health nurse for over 23 years and is a fellow with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments focusing on environmental justice and air pollution in Tulsa. She serves as co-coordinator of Tulsa Ready for 100, which is part of a national movement of people working to inspire local leaders to embrace a vision of healthier communities powered with 100% clean, renewable energy. Nancy is a member of the MetCare Environmental Justice Team, which is currently focused on climate justice and increasing access to weatherization and energy efficiency updates for Tulsans who are challenged with um, energy insecurity. As a City of Tulsa Data Pioneer volunteer, she co-led the effort to complete the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy's Clean City Energy Scorecard, which enables cities to measure their progress and identify policies and programs that save energy, promote renewable energy, and reduce greenhouse emissions. She is passionate about community gardening and enjoys connecting to the earth and other people at the Vernon AME Garden on Greenwood Avenue. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Anna Zeta. Dr. Zeta is an assistant professor of history at Oklahoma State University. She researches and teaches on environmental history, food studies, history of science and environmental and food justice. Dr. Zeta is also a co-organizer of the OSU Food Studies Program. Her first book, Canned, The Rise and Fall of Consumer Confidence in the American Food Industry, won the prestigious James Beard Award in 2019. She's now working on a second book project on the history of food waste in, in, in America. C 
seeking to understand how political, economic, and cultural changes in the 20th century have led to a situation where we waste 40% of all food, producing 8% of greenhouse gases that contribute to the climate crisis and deepening problems of hunger and food injustice in our nation. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for, for participating in today's Real Talk on Environmental Justice. Just from reading you ladies' um, bios, I can tell that this is gonna be a really fruitful and important information today. Um, so I wanted to start with the history of environmental justice and food injustice. And Dr. Zeta, would you like to pick up there? Thank you, Autumn, for the introduction. And um, I'll do my best to stay within my 10 minutes, but I also wanted to start with a quick um, kind of anecdote that I've been thinking on a lot in the last few weeks. Um, just this semester, I taught my just basic US history survey course since the Civil War. And it's a 230 some student class, huge survey, a lot of dis, you know uninterested freshmen in the class, unfortunately. And I got my evaluations at the end of the semester. And largely I was really pleased to see kind of that students seemed to get a lot out of the class. There was this one particular review um, that has stuck with me and I've been thinking a lot about it and I wanted to read it out loud um, and to connect it to environmental justice here obvious, in an obvious way, I think. And it says, um, this reminds me of those things, I don't know if you've seen where like, you know, celebrities read bad reviews of themselves or mean things people say on Twitter. So I'll try to not uh, get emotional, but um, after a few weeks, it got really annoying because it felt like all we talked about was racism. Yes, that's an important part of history and such, but there is more to our history than racism. And I was interested to learn about it, had it been taught. Even the last lecture over Hurricane Katrina talked about how the hurricane highlighted the disparities and racisms from white people to black people. And that was all that was discussed about it. How are hurricanes tied to racism, especially hurricanes that happen in regions where the populations are largely minorities? Is mother nature racist now? Other than that, she did a good job making historical stories, the few that didn't revolve around racism, interesting. <laughs> so um, anyway, I read this and part of me felt kind of proud because, you know, uh, these are the kind of students that at least it seems like they're, they're reaching a sense of what I'm trying to put out there, which is that you can't really tell US history or history in general without engaging deeply with the historical foundations of race and racism in our country. And especially as gets um, as the review gets to in the end, that a lot of this racism plays out in environmental terms, in terms of land displacement, of ownership, of agricultural production, all of these things that are so intimately tied with environment and race. And that question, is mother nature racist now? I just thought like, I need to write a book called that, or I need to teach a class called that. Cause you know, in some ways it couldn't better capture what we're trying to talk about today which is that of course, mother nature herself isn't racist, but who and what and how mother nature affects most harmfully has nearly everything to do with human structural political decisions, many of which are rooted in deeply racist policies where different communities are built, how some people live in more low-lying areas than others, how that, that affects them when there comes to be hurricanes or tornadoes, how polluting industries are cited. All of these things determine how, um, how environmental harm is disproportionately um, you know, given out, so to speak. So just, I wanted to start with that and to say that I think that history really matters. I mean, I'm a historian, so obviously I think so, but I think understanding sort of where these institutions are built. It's been really interesting recently, um, both with COVID-19 and the pandemic and recent protests against racial injustice, it seems like there has been more attention to how historically rooted, you can't understand any of this without understanding Jim Crow, without understanding redlining, all of these really critical historical practices. So in the case of environmental justice, and I'll speak a little to food justice too, because that's um, even more closely in some ways what I work on. Although I would say that the kind of campaigns for um, to, against environmental injustices go back quite deep. I mean, I think we could find uh, instances that relate to it in some way for more than a century. Um, the biggest movements, which have been led largely by 
Black, Indigenous, and people of color throughout the 20th century um, sort of begin as a lot of these stories with the movements in the 1960s to recognize civil rights and environmental issues and how they intertwine together. Everything from Cesar Chavez's work with Latino farm workers and pesticide pollution in California to a well-known case um, in Houston where Black residents um, tried to stop a, a garbage dump that was being built. And one of the activists in that case was Robert Bullard, who kind of has been come to be known as the father of environmental justice. He calls himself an accidental environmentalist, but he was pulled in by this very local case to start writing and talking and um, educating about environmental justice more broadly. But the kind of really landmark story that brought environmental justice to the national stage, um, and of course I'm talking from an American perspective, but there's many really important international uh, foundations of environmental justice work. But in the US, um, Warren County, North Carolina, 1982, is the case that's often attributed with bringing environmental justice to the federal attention, to national attention. And in that case, the state of North Carolina wanted to gather up all of this um, PCB contaminated soil from the roadways of different parts of the state and then truck all of this contaminated soil and put it in Warren County, which of course was one of the three um, or I think few counties in the state with a majority black population. And um, you know the decision making that goes into this question of where these hazardous materials are dumped, where landfills are built, where polluting industries are built, has everything to do with a sense of where the least political social capital exists, where people are least likely to fight, um, to not have the resources and the money and the time and the energy to do the fighting, the kind of not in my backyard nimbyism that has prevented the siting of a lot of polluting industries in more well-off and often wider neighborhoods um, is thought to not exist as strongly in these, uh, in these neighborhoods. Thankfully, that has not always been the case. But in any case, in that case, the, the state did end up dumping the PCB soil, but the, the protests, the, um, you know, there were many activists who stopped the trucks entering Warren County. This brought to the national attention this question of environmental racism. And you start to have lots of reports coming out in the late 80s um, from the federal government, the General Accounting Office, and then the United Church of Christ creates a landmark report um, in 87, which documents um, how what the close alignment between hazardous waste sites and black communities throughout the country showing with really hard data the correlation between um, those those things. Um, and that kind of leads into the 1990s where the environmental justice organizations start to look for allies within mainstream environmental organizations, calling out major groups like the National Res Resources Defense Council, Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, a lot of these mainstream environmental organizations for having a history of racism in those environmental organizations. Unfortunately, many of the kind of fathers of environmentalism, John Muir, D Henry David Thoreau, others wrote really disparagingly of Black and Indigenous peoples. Um, Madison Grant, who was one of the major conservationists of the early 20th century, was also um, the leading, a leading proponent of eugenics and inspired Hitler and um, other white nationalist groups. And so these environmental justice groups pointed to these mainstream environmental organizations and said, uh, you have racial bias in how you're developing policy. You have almost no people of color on your staffs. You are not paying attention to um, the places where we live, work, and play. That's kind of a major theme of environmental justice is not just nature out there in the wilderness, in the protection of, you know, mountains and endangered species and water, all of which is critical, but also ignores where we live, work, and play, the communities and environments that are part of our everyday in more urban and uh, suburban settings. Um, so this leads in 1991 to the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. So this is, you know, almost 30 years ago. Um, and even now, 1991 doesn't seem so long ago to me, but thinking that these issues have been not just talked about, but on national stage for 30 years, and yet we're still having to, you know, redefine and begin the conversation today, I think really gives a sense of just how slow the progress is, how deeply rooted the activism is, but the attention that's given to it and the policy change 
has been slower to follow. Um, so just to conclude, I think today the environmental justice movement is really expanding its uh, categories to think about climate justice, which several of our speakers can talk about as the um, effects of the climate crisis continue to deepen, that again, poor people, uh, people of color are most likely to be vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, um, which has become very obvious again in our moment of global pandemic, which is not unrelated to climate change either. And looking to things like food justice, which I maybe will talk about later in questions, but um, thinking about food, how we grow food, how we have access to healthy food as not just something that we should make sure everyone has the nutrition they need, but thinking about how to end the structural in inequities that lead to unequal health outcomes um, among different groups of people and how comorbidities emerge um, in terms of different um, food related, diet related health diseases and susceptibility to other, uh, to other diseases. So um, just to say, you know, there's a really deep important history to everything that we're talking about today and paying attention to where these institutions got built, how these foundations got laid, I think can help us in some ways to think both about turning points about where moments of change happened and how, and to model sort of today's activism and movements, um, thinking about history and historical context. Thank you, Dr. Zeta. That was really informative. Um, you mentioned that the movement kind of sprang up in 1991, and, um, but with um, cases happening before that. Um, I'll say that environmental justice and the topic of, um, and, and such topics, I did not become familiar with until I read an article two years ago for um, a research class. And the article was talking about how disproportionately asthma was, was in um, black people living in lower income um, societies. And I started thinking about that correlation um, because when I think of the Northeast side of Oklahoma city, there are a lot of like dump sites and truck fill up places and things of that nature. And you um, also throw in the fact that it's a food desert. And so when you start to see these disproportionate kind of like health factors, you can't help but wonder if their geographical location kind of plays a part in that. Yeah, and so, because our, our health is the foundation of, you know, all other abilities and successes in life, you know, that's, it's such, so important. Yeah, so that's that's really interesting. Um, thank you for giving us the history of environmental justice. Um, very informative. I kind of want to switch gears and discuss environmental environmental justice from a hazards perspective, and I'd like Maggie to take that. Yes. Hi. Um, well, first, I want to uh, thank you all for having me here, Anna. Thank you for laying out the history of environmental justice in just ten minutes, um, and for sharing that comment from your evaluations. I, I had to keep myself from laughing because mother nature might not be racist, but our systems uh, definitely can be. And I'll get to that more here in a little bit. So I'm going to keep this as brief as I can because I am excited to hear from everybody else on this panel and to have a conversation with you all as well as people tuning in on Facebook. Um, so the perspective on this, uh, that I'm bringing here that I'm going to talk from is from environmental justice and a hazards disasters perspective. But really there is no one hazard disaster environmental justice perspective. This is just um, where I'm coming from and is in the tradition of my own training, uh, which is effectively summed up as having two facets. First, um, that disasters are an inherently social phenomenon. So a triggering event such as hurricane wind, storm surge, or in this case, um, COVID-19 doesn't necessarily make the disaster, but it's just the source of damage. And um, the disaster occurs in the impact on individual coping patterns that result in disruption to social, economic, and political systems. And a good way to identify a disruption um, in this regard is to look for adaptations. So I'm sure we all have a list of ways that we've adapted to life um, in light of COVID-19. For those of us who don't have essential worker positions, that looks like working from home, telehealth services instead of in-person medical visits, the use of face coverings and so on. And um, actually this panel is a, a kind of a form of an adaptation that we've made in light of COVID-19. We're here 
streaming live on Facebook, talking to each other on Zoom instead of in person, as I'm sure I, I personally would have preferred to see all of your faces um, in front of me. But since disasters are rooted in social structure, their impacts are felt in accordance with those existing structures and how they shape our lives. So vulnerability um, to disasters reflect weaknesses in social structures or social systems. And vulnerability to disasters is critical when thinking about disaster impacts. So when we consider how a disaster impacts somewhere like Oklahoma, we have to think about the history of Oklahoma, but also weaknesses that are within the social structure or systems that already exist before the disaster strikes. And in the US, something that is embedded into our history as Anna spoke to and into our social structure and thus presents a weakness or vulnerability um, is inequality and more specifically racial inequality uh, caused by racism. And when I'm talking about racism here, I'm referencing less belief, um, the belief that people have unequal traits, but I'm speaking more to racism as prejudice and discrimination evident in policy that affect people unequally along lines of race. And so vulnerability though is reflective of social structure is experienced really personally at the individual level and influenced um, by individual circumstances that have been shaped by structure as well. And this is where I found um, and many have spoken to the overlap between environmental justice and hazards and disaster research specifically. So environmental justice or inequalities happen when some communities and individuals experience disproportionate environmental burdens, undue environmental burdens, and the process through which this occurs is related to um, political power, um, marginalization, things that will shape um, siting decisions and limit or otherwise influence where people live, uh, such as segregation. And so the same social structure and processes that result in environmental justice concerns shape vulnerability and disaster experiences. So when we're thinking specifically about COVID-19, there are obvious physiological um, factors that shape vulnerability, but pre-COVID conditions um, embedded in society can make it more difficult to, for example, protect ourselves or take preventative measures. And this slide right here might look familiar to you. It's from the Oklahoma State COVID uh, What You Should Know page. And here we've seen and heard a lot of this before, but the things that we've all been told to do to limit our risk are things like wash your hands with soap and water. If that's unavailable, use hand sanitizer, avoid touching your face, avoid close contact with people who are sick and effectively practice social distancing. But the things that are outlined in these um, orange squares here each get a little more difficult to do um, when considering things like individual household context, work context, household composition, because there are some folks who might not be able to effectively practice social distancing. For example, if you're in a multi-generational household, right, it's going to be harder to maintain distance between residents if you have an essential job and are an essential worker and have to engage um, with the public often or in close proximity with other essential workers, limiting your risk can be more difficult. So work conditions are particularly concerning because these are things that again are outside the control of individual workers who are at risk of COVID infection in the workplace. So Texas County um, in the Panhandle has the third most cases at the county level of COVID in Oklahoma, which is related most closely to um, an outbreak and a meat packing plant in which working conditions restrict effective social distancing practices. So in terms of those at high risk, to COVID-19, we've all heard that older adults and those who have serious chronic medical conditions are at higher risk of getting very sick, right? Um, chronic medical conditions that are often referenced are things like heart disease, diabetes, um, lung disease, but chronic disease and poverty are related. Healthcare professionals and health organizations recognize this relationship between socioeconomic status and chronic illness. The World Health Organization released a report 
on preventing chronic disease where they stated chronic disease and poverty are interconnected in a vicious cycle, right? And they go on to note that chronic disease burden is concentrated among the poor, that poor people are more vulnerable for several reasons, including increased exposure to risk and decreased access to health services, which I think um, Nancy's going to speak to a little bit later. Um, chronic disease can also cause poverty in individuals and families and draw folks into the sort of downward spiral of worsening disease and poverty. And uh, Tom Boyce, MD Chief of UCSF's Division of Departmental Medicine has been quoted as saying that socioeconomic status is the most powerful predictor of disease disorder, injury, and mortality that we have. In the same vein, race-based inequalities can create circumstances that increase risk of chronic disease. So weathering is a concept that was developed by Arlene Geronimus and speaks to a sense of, um, or speaks to physiological health erosion from constant stress. And she notes the ways that marginalized people and their communities cope with big and small stressors related to things like socioeconomic status, race, race-based discrimination, especially, um, can have a, a heavy toll on the body and on your ability to fight infection, stay well. And I'm going to end on this note. Um, as mentioned at the start, I wanted to keep this really brief, but um, Arlene Geronimus was recently quoted in a New York Times article as saying, the accumulated the accumulated effects of environmental inequality are compounded by the physiological ramifications of an atmosphere of bias and discrimination, which have been documented to lead to higher rates of poor health outcomes for Black Americans. So Autumn, in your comment after Anna um, spoke, you said that you started thinking about these connections in Tulsa, right? And these things are definitely related. Environmental justice concerns um, health inequalities and uh, racism within our history and thus our social structure, political processes definitely all interact with one another to disproportionately burden certain members of our populations. And we're seeing that now and with every disaster, we saw that in Katrina, right? So the hurricane wasn't racist, but our systems are. And we see that evident post-disaster in almost every circumstance. And you mentioned Katrina, and one thing that I took note of um, during your talk was your mention of the social infrastructure before the disaster. So it's not that Mother Nature is racist, but the infrastructure of these neighborhoods and of these communities before the disaster leads to the ramification, the result that we see afterwards. So I think uh, Hurricane Katrina is the best example to kind of set that stage up and give that imagery of the infrastructure of certain communities before Katrina took place, the levees that weren't properly built, built to begin with and how that affected um, black community, the black community during that disaster. So thank you, Maggie. That, that was a very um, interesting way of explaining environmental justice from a disaster's point of view. So I really appreciate that. Carly, what are some examples or issues that highlight what we've talked about in the context of the indigenous community? Yeah, um, so we've kind of been discussing um, different kinds of systemic challenges that um, result in inequalities coming about. And we see those impacting indigenous communities and tribal populations in a variety of ways. Um, when we're thinking about environmental justice, um, we think about it in the context of um, what natural resources ex exist in tribal areas, um, who has authority on how to control those natural resources, when those natural use resources are used, um, is there exploitation involved um, with that um, extraction activity or other type of usage? And who's left to um, clean it up and what type of lingering effects are seen from that? Um, and we, we see this in a variety of ways. Um, as a Cherokee citizen here in Oklahoma, I've been following um, the Sequoia Fuels case and um, Sarah Hill, who is the Attorney General at uh, Cherokee Nation, had worked on this um, even before she ascended to that um, spot. And what had happened was uh, Sequoia Fuels was um, a uh, uranium um, processor um, here, and there was a bunch of leftover um, hazardous material. And the settlement had indicated Sequoia Fuels was supposed to dispose of that after it had closed. 
they couldn't find a cost effective way to do that. So they sent out notice that they were just going to bury it on site. Well, that site is within the Cherokee Nation and is at the confluence of three rivers, which um, from, you know, uh, Northeastern Oklahoma and, you know, the basins that they flow from have the potential to be seriously impacted by uranium leaching because when it comes to uranium disposal or uranium byproduct disposal, it's not a matter of if it leaks, it's when, even when you have those protective membranes that go in there at some point, um, you know, whether it's five years, 10 years, a hundred years, there's going to be a leak at some point. So um, Sarah Hill was able to work effectively in partnership with the state of Oklahoma to require that settlement agreement to be enforced and ultimately got um, all of that uh, leftover uranium removed from the state of Oklahoma and sent to, I believe, a milling plant in Utah where it was able to be processed um, to be more radiologically neutral. So without um, the influence and um, the participation of the Cherokee Nation protecting their tribal treaty rights with regard to their water usage and their water quality, we probably wouldn't have seen a resolution like that. And that's been consistent. We've seen um, industry activity that's resulted in leftover um, pollution that tribes have been on the hook to clean up. So we see that in Cherokee Nation and we see it especially in the Quapaw Nation in far Northeast Oklahoma as a result of the Superfund site there. Um, in Pitcher, Oklahoma, which is where um, the mining activities occurred where you've got those big chat piles um, that were very detrimental to the area and ultimately um, caused Pitcher to become an abandoned town because of the Superfund status. Quapaw Nation has had to work very closely with the EPA in order to secure enough funds and bring matching funds to the table to do the cleanup necessary. And Quapaw has been very invested in their agricultural activity, and they were able to leverage some of those funds to do uh, thorough topsoil replacement and are now converting that previously um, contaminated site to do food production on that. Um, so they're, the, heart, the, the good part about it is tribes are willing to do the work where we see um, places where um, maybe the state or non-tribal governments are not able to interject appropriately or our federal government doesn't have the resources or the uh, political will to do the work. Um, but we see tribal communities stepping in and that's not really their responsibility because they aren't the ones that caused um, the pollution. They aren't the ones that caused the waste, but for some reason they're left holding the bag when it comes to cleanup efforts. And that's not just you know consistent with tribes in Oklahoma. We see that in Navajo Nation with regard to um, the uranium mining that's seen out there that's caused significant pollution, especially in their water resources. And we also see that in the Havasupai tribes near the Grand Canyon where uranium mining has been a particular concern. Um, and all of those go towards um, impacting the natural resources from a soil and water perspective and how um, that impacts the ability for these tribes to um, engage in food sovereignty and support their own people through food systems. Now, if you have, you know, land that's available, but it's, it's polluted, who wants to eat food that's been grown off of it, especially if you're not sure if that, you know, plant product or um, livestock that you're running isn't pulling um, the pollution out of the soil. Now there are some more natural remediation opportunities that are available and a lot of tribes are exploring hemp as the possibility to plant because hemp does draw a lot of those heavy metals out of the soil, but we don't know how long it's going to take um, for full remediation to occur. We don't know the um, cost to do it in an effective and efficient manner from a time frame perspective. Um, and then we also see on the flip side, um, corporate agriculture when it comes in. Here in Northeastern Oklahoma, um, especially in Delaware County, uh, Cherokee Nation has a lot of allotted land up there. So to backtrack a little bit, um, removed tribes that have come to Oklahoma, um, that there's most of them were removed to Oklahoma from other places. But when we're talking about the, um, the Cherokee Nation, Chickasaw Nation, Muscogee Creek, Seminole, and Choctaw Nation, those tribes went through allotment processes. So the Parcels were um, broken up and assigned to individual tribal members um, in the late in the early 1900s, and some of those um, areas remain allotted, which means they're under the direct control of the tribe, rather than being under the control of the state. So once they fall out of this, what's called allotted status, um, it's called a fee status, and then that goes under um, the authority of the state. So there are a lot of these allotted parcels that still remain and exist um, in Delaware County. And we've seen a proliferation of um, corporate poultry houses um, coming in up there. And the pollution that comes off of these poultry houses is significant from an air pollution perspective with ammonia and then also from a water pollution perspective. And the water pollution perspective is a little bit nuanced because it has to do with the usage. These poultry houses use a lot of water um, and the aquifers that they draw from 
the more water they use, the less recharge those aquifers get. And when you see that lack of uh, quantity of water, um, we don't get the same uh, water quality because that recharge requires a certain volume of water for um, all the pollution or other types of um, particulates or sediment that come in there for it to be um, resolved. And, you know, we like to use the cute little phrase, you know, the solution to pollution is dilution when it comes to water, but we're not seeing that. And so those tribal populations of peoples that have been on these a lot, owned and lived on these allotted parcels since pre-statehood um, has been incredibly detrimental to the ability of them to live and work and run their own agriculture operations in competition with some of the pollution challenges they've seen from this poultry house proliferation. And when we see um, corporate corporations coming in and um, seeking to make use of tribal resources, whether it's land or water or you know um, air, whatever it is, a lot of times they'll seek to locate in rural poor tribal regions, um, tempting the tribes with jobs partnerships or other sorts of opportunities like a tribal hiring preference in order to kind of smooth over the, with the tribe and prevent them from um, um, having recourse against that corporation because of the pre-existing partnership. And it leaves the citizens kind of surrounded um, and on their own as far as how to fight that and challenge it. We've seen some successful pushback um, through recognizing these when they come up and identify them. Tri tribal peoples are becoming much more savvy about identifying, um, looking down the road and saying, you know, we may get a, a short-term benefit from it from jobs creation, but what's the long-term cost? Um, or who's gonna be on the hook for remediation? Who's gonna be covering up when we don't have enough water um, to serve our peoples or when the air pollution is so bad that we can't even step outside and breathe? So um, we see a lot of different ways that that kind of impacts um, tribal communities from an environmental perspective. And then all of that directly ties into the ability um, to have uh, food sovereignty, because uh, if you don't have good quality resources to produce food, uh, you're not going to be able to. And tribal agriculture is incredibly important, especially if we've seen with um, COVID-19 disruptions in our food systems because we don't have a local or regional resiliency in place or redundancy in place. We're so dependent upon this national just-in-time food system that when we see those disruptions, we see a very quick crumbling that um, backs up and impacts things further out on the chain. So whether it's a transportation holdup, whether people in processing plants are getting too sick to come to work and uh, producers are having a large volume of livestock that would be otherwise ready for processing and they're having to either give it away or euthanize in order to manage those populations. Um, that's directly impactful, especially for tribal communities, because 200 years of federal Indian policy have resulted in tribes being underdeveloped from an ag and food systems perspective and also heavily reliant on federal nutrition programs. And across um, tribal nations, we've seen an average of about an 11% increase um, for those um, nutrition programs, whether it's SNAP or whether it's the food distribution program on Indian reservations. And some uh, tribal locations have had an up to 50% increase. So if you can imagine, you know, more than 50% of people that were receiving services are coming and saying, we need help, we need access to these commodity foods, um, we need access to food stamps in order to be able to feed our families because we've lost our jobs. That is huge for Indian country. And I'm sure there's other parts of um, the United States that have seen increases like that, but it is particularly noticeable in Indian country. And if you're looking for um, a blatant example of where our food systems are failing or where we have broken brokenness or challenges in that, you need look no further than Indian country from that perspective. Carly, you talked a lot about agriculture and um, how it pertains to indigenous communities. And Dr. Zeta, I definitely want to hear from you after we speak with Nancy about uh, food injustice and how it impacts the larger community outside of um, the tribal, the tribal folks. So um, now we're going to go to Nancy. And Nancy, I'd like for you to expand on local examples or issues that we've highlighted so far within the context of Tulsa. Uh, I was in a, um, the, the, the Facebook uh, group, Save Our States, when uh, listening to uh, Governor Stitt talk about uh, the fact that, well, he was asked, Are there, is there going to be any accounting for race on COVID-19 stats? And he said he didn't see any reason for that. Of course, you know, I started yelling at the computer. 
And uh, because, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have seen many reports in, in cities throughout the country where show that uh, African Americans have, and, and brown folks and also Native Americans have been disproportionately uh, affected by COVID. And when I made a comment, someone also asked me, how can, how can a, uh, a virus be racist? And it really has to do with, uh, you know, the host response. If, you, if, if we are less, we have pre-existing conditions, if we're, you know, exposed to environmental toxins, air toxins, if we have, don't have access to uh, health care, if we live in substandard housing, you know, our readiness for our body to mount, you know, a defense against something as virulent as the COVID-19 virus is very challenged. And in terms of Oklahoma, I mean, Tulsa, uh, what I read most recently is that 23% uh, of our cases, at least a few days ago, were among Latinx community who represent 10% of our population. So, and then in terms of the coverage of environmental, uh, of air pollution in its relationship to uh, COVID-19, it was very unreported. So when mayors were asked about the disproportionate uh, effect of COVID on people of color, you know, air pollution didn't come up, even though uh, some studies have revealed that the counties with the highest uh, amounts of air pollution have even some of the highest rates of COVID infection. So I was fortunate enough to uh, be chosen as a fellow with the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments and uh, one of three in our EPA uh, district and a region. And I think the best, the great thing about it, aside from studying these issues, just reading about online, having conversations, is that this, uh, this fellowship allowed me to go directly into communities and talk to people about the effects of you know, toxic air pollution on their quality of life and their health. And uh, that has been very meaningful for me. I live uh, around 41st and Riverside. You know, I see the refinery across the way, never really ventured over there and you know, didn't have a reason to. And when I did, the, for the first time during last year's flood, the air was just, horrific. And, you know, I, I came back with a, a scratchy throat and I just thought, what would it be like to live there all the time? I'm also a co-coordinator co of the Ready for 100 campaign, which is a nationwide campaign to, uh, to uh, convince city officials and municipalities to uh, transition to 100% renewable energy to power all our needs, electricity by 2035 and all other energy sectors, you know, transportation, heating uh, by renewable energy by 2050. So let's talk about Tulsa a little bit. Uh, Tulsa you know, is challenged. We're the 23rd most challenging place to live in the U.S. if you have allergies, and allergies are on the rise due to climate change because you know, when we have uh, excessive CO2 in our atmosphere, that you know, causes plants to release more pollen. So people are getting more miserable. Sometimes you know, it's said that people aren't going to respond to climate change unless it directs them uh, directly affects them. But you know, maybe those of you with itchy eyes and headaches, you know, might you know might wake up to the fact that it is happening now and affecting you. And it's also the 37th most place most challenging place to live is asthma. Here in Tulsa, asthma rates are highest on the north side and the west side of Tulsa. And recently, uh, the American Lung Association said they report. Uh, gave us, they do annual uh, ratings and we got an F for ozone. And ozone is basically smog and it's formed from a chemical reaction of nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds in the presence of heat and sunlight. And so today uh, we, and yesterday and tomorrow, I do believe uh, we will uh, be at people who are, you know, are more vulnerable to air pollution, those with, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, lung disease, elderly, children uh, will be at greater risk because of ozone pollution. And it's, this is, ozone is something we've been battling, you know, for days. And part of the reason is that, you know, we are a state that is, uh, is uh, very dominated by the oil and gas industry. So this slide, it's very detailed, but you can see at the very bottom that 
the Tulsa, Muskogee, Bartlesville uh, region is uh, in the is top is the 12th uh, most impacted metropolitan area in terms of health by ozone pollution. And this is a slide that uh, from uh, oh gosh I can't see the oh yeah the uh, uh, publication Trouble in the Air. I, uh, and, and this was from 2018. And in 2018, Tulsa had, was, had the fourth highest numbers of, of days when air was unhealthy because of the presence of what's called a PM 2.5 or particulate matter, which are just tiny little particles of pollution, less than one thirtieth the, the, the width of the size of hair. You know, it's so sh we can breathe it into our lungs. It easily goes in our bloodstream. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. It uh, is, you know, associated with uh, premature death, all kinds of diseases. You know, air pollution affects us. I like to say, you know, from our bones to our brain. There's no no part of our body that's not not affected. And uh, so, and and although but I didn't have a slide, it, uh, the EPA showed that in 40. Six out of 50 states, uh, African Americans uh, breathe air that's contaminated by PM 2.5 in, you know, at greater rates than than white Americans. And part of the reason we had such high PM 2.5 this year is because of uh, of wildfires, and, and we are at greater risk. This slide uh, is an interesting. You can you know maybe take a look at this screen yourself. Uh, this uh, uh, screening tool yourself. It's, I mean, going on these sites are pretty complicated, but what this this shows is you can see the dark purple. Those are areas where uh, the, these industries have high rate, high toxic scores. Those toxic scores are calculated by the the number of pounds of that of toxic chemicals are released times their toxicity. Some toxics are not more dangerous than others and times the amount of people affected. So you can see from this map over on West Tulsa and North Tulsa, the east side of Tulsa by the airport. Uh, you know, there, and the interesting thing, and I, I, I hate, sometimes I hate using that word interesting because it's, it's not just interesting, it's, it's disgraceful. That, uh, you know, some of the, if you, if you can go on to each of these individual companies, you'll see that their, their taxa scores are actually higher than the median scores of companies, you know, within their, their industry. And this is just something, you know, I just want to introduce to you. If you ever want to look up the environmental justice screening tool, you can type in your address and you can learn what kind of facilities are near you. Those that have to report to the EPA for toxic water or air emissions, brownfields. You can look in terms of, you know, uh, the demographics of the folks, schools nearby, low-income housing nearby. And it's a great tool to learn more. My my uh, my uh, role my my project was going out and interviewing people door to door that lived next nearby the Holler Refinery, and we interviewed 110 people. Also did this in the Heights and in Crosby Heights, which I can't really discuss now. It's too much, <laughs> too much time. So fence line communities, those communities that are right next to an oil and gas facility, and they're impacted, you know by noise, odor, traffic, you know, diesel trucks going in and out, chemical emissions. And most of these same communities are populated by low-income individuals and community of color. And there's just not a lot of environmental, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, other economic opportunities or, or, you know, good things happen in the community that adds their quality of life. So Holly Frontier East and West uh, were named by the Political Economy Research Institute, which is housed out of the University of Massachusetts as the top uh, top 100 air toxic emitter and number 78 in water toxins emitted. And this, uh, this institute uses uh, the same uh, toxic score where you look at what's released, how toxic it is, how many people, how, 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 how far it, it, it spreads and who's exposed. So, 44% uh, of the people exposed were identified as Hispanic or non-white, and 24% live below the poverty level, which is higher than you know our national poverty level. So these are a couple pictures I took, and it's you know I call that little park there on a you know the saddest little park in Tulsa. You know, not only is it right uh, next to the refinery, but it's right alongside the highway. 
The soccer field there is next to the refinery, but the picture on the top right is a uh, cement batch mixing um, <clears throat> batch, uh, plant, a uh, Delise. And I looked them up and they were cited several years, several of the last uh, years since uh, 2012 for having to report for excess lead emissions. This tells you a little bit about where the PM2 uh, <clears throat> emitters are. And you can see over there on the, you know, on the right uh, or left, you know, on the West Tulsa and also East Tulsa and a little bit on North Tulsa. But uh, it's, uh, so it's kind of a toxic stew. <laughs> of chemicals. So we asked people, Is there a do you have a problem with the air quality in your neighborhood? 80% said yes. And, and, and in the Heights and Crosby, it was over 90%. How often does it smell bad? It's, you know, upwards towards like 85%, it's either frequently or occasionally. And how are people affected? And this was very disturbing. You know, first of all, they don't like the way it stinks. And anytime you smell something bad, it's it's a source of, it's a source of environmental stress. You wonder what am I breathing? If it's unhealthy, and it actually triggers protective responses in the body because the body's like, there's something wrong. This is a signal that I, there's, I could be hurt, and so it produces inflammation. The uh, irritation to eyes, nose, and throat, 43 uh, percent, triggers uh, asthma, breathing problems one third, avoid going outside, not allowing the children to go outside. We heard some just awful stories. And of course, it seemed very obvious to most people that the, it was the oil refineries that were causing, and there's two on the west side there. And uh, just to keep in mind too, that um, this is an area where um, uh, City of Tulsa and HUD are, and are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in new housing over there. And some of the people, Ask me like I don't understand why they're they're doing this. It's not livable. Like I I wouldn't move here. And when I lived on the east side or I lived on the south side, I never had a sore throat. Like why are they doing this? And some of them were very suspicious that you know for now you know people wanted to have that riverfront property. You know that the uh, the gathering place was there. And so 88% felt like people should take, uh, that the city council should take action. And some of the ideas presented were planting more trees, uh, enacting stricter pollution controls, attracting clean energy businesses, energy efficiency. So they had a lot of ideas. And this, this uh, was very heartbreaking to me. You know, one woman who lived across from, directly across from the refinery, she, she asked us to say, asked the uh, city officials, make it smell better for us poor folks. So finally, I have my hands in a lot of different pots and uh, you know, trying to just get more folks who I know are concerned and I know they're out there. They, you know, we sometimes, we know there's a problem and we need to know how much, but there's some really great opportunities right now. Tulsa is about to engage in a process of uh, reviewing our comprehensive plan. And within that plan, it says we have a goal to become a leader in sustainability, carbon neutrality, and to provide incentives for energy efficiency. So we wanna make sure that we hold the city of Tulsa's feet to the fire and that uh, they, they fulfill these goals. And last review was four years ago and there had been no action in these areas. The Tulsa Sustainability Plan uh, came out in 2021, it pretty much stayed on the shelf. So many great ideas, so many wonderful uh, community volunteers and uh, civil servants who worked on this. And there, you know, we shouldn't let all that effort, all that, go to not. So we have opportunities here in Tulsa to, to get to, to increase community engagement on these topics, uh, such as you know, a, uh, having a climate action plan, making sure that part of our, uh, our, house, our housing affordable, our affordable housing uh, services include energy efficiency, you know, and we have a voice and I think we can make some noise and that we can be heard in numbers. Thank you. Yeah, and thank, thank you, Nancy. I love the way that you um, summed up the, the ways that the air quality and the environment is point blank affecting um, certain individuals in the community. But one thing that stood out to me was you said Tulsa was the 23rd most challenging place to live with allergies. And I, uh, one of my best friends flew to Oklahoma from Michigan and she got off the plane and um, her eyes were gray, 
watering. I mean, she literally thought she was dying. And it turns out it was just her allergies. But was she- in Oklahoma City? Yes, it was in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City's worse. Yes. And so, and it was, it was, it was so funny because we, we were calling optometrists. Her eyesight was really messed up. We were planning on taking her to an eye doctor, but it just turned out to be allergies. And so when you mentioned that, it, it kind of made me think of that story about just how her allergies were triggered within two hours of stepping foot in the state. So that is a major problem that you just broke down so, um, so well. I know we're getting close on the hour, but I have a couple of questions to pose to the panelists. Um, first, I wanted to ask, how do you see these issues of environmental justice being heightened in this moment of a global pandemic, being that we are in the wake of COVID-19? Well, I'll say a word about uh, food justice in this moment, very much connecting to what Carly was talking about, but I'm you know, certainly in the, in the indigenous communities and across the US as a whole, you're just seeing, I think, this moment where things that had been invisible are being made visible in all different kinds of ways. And I, for me, someone who studies kind of the business and supply, supply system side of a lot of the way our food system has been built, it's been really fascinating to see people discovering for the first time, um, you know, not only that there's police brutality, but also that, um, you know, our food may not show up in our grocery stores if the supply chains that lead them to get there are broken. If there are massive outbreaks of COVID-19 in slaughterhouses and food processing facilities, which we're seeing so much of because of who's deemed essential workers and because of these other issues we've been talking about throughout the hour. If you have, as we do, kind of two supply chains set up, one directed to consumers and one directed to institutions, and those institutions are not buying as much in this moment, then you have this entire stream of food that's being wasted, being destroyed, and that can't be repurposed to go into consumer um, markets in the same way. So all of these things that exist behind the scenes of all of the way that our society operates until this moment has been invisible. Um, and now that the visibility, I think, as depressing as it is, and as much as it brings all of us an awareness of a lot of tragedy and injustice around, a lot of people are also talking about the opportunity that this poses to take this recognition um, and do something with it, that perhaps a kind of public eye opening and public reckoning of all of these problems that exist and are indeed interwoven may make space for change, um, which in some respects we're seeing small pieces of. So I find some small piece of hope amid all of this and um, think that, I don't know, maybe Maggie could speak this too, but how disasters do make us stop um, you know, business as usual to think about what, what else could, could be. Yeah, I think that with um, picking it up there, I think that there's been so much wide uh, scale disruption and impacts from COVID specifically that we're really, we've reached a point and are going to keep running into um, this issue of having to reconceptualize how to move forward in a more just way uh, across the board, because you can't um, as I mentioned in, earlier in my presentation, as I think we all alluded to, it's all related, right? It's like you can't just silo and focus on one issue, right? Public health is related to environmental justice and environmental degradation, and those things are also uh, related and in influence and influenced by uh, systematic inequalities. Well, that about wraps up our time. Again, a big thank you to each of the participants on the panel, and thank you to those tuning in to today's Real Talk on Environmental Justice. If you would like to learn more about the Tri-City Collective, I encourage you to visit our website, www.tricitycollective.com. Also, like us on Facebook and Instagram by following us at Tri-City Collective OK. Have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great day. Bye.